All right. Hello and welcome to the Concussion Legacy Foundation webinar, Solving the Invisible Wounds of War, Prioritizing CT Research for Military Veterans, as part of our International CTE Awareness Month series. I'm Dr. Chris Nowinski, co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Neil Vazdev from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health here to give us an overview of his research. Major General Dennis Thompson to talk about his involvement with Project Enlist uh, Canada as a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. Dr. Alex Balbeer to discuss his work at Wounded Warrior Project and the resources available for veterans right now. We had Allison Lehman joining us, but she had a family emergency and we will film her later and share her interview. We also have Scott Wirt here from our team at CLF to discuss Project Enlist and why uh, we're starting this important program. We will take a few questions for Dr. Vazdev at the end of his talk, so feel free to submit any you might have to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And a quick note to let you know we're recording this webinar and plan to send it out uh, to the emails you registered with, so don't worry if you have to step away. Uh, we post the webinar recordings on our social media page as well, so if you don't know, if you're not following us already, please be sure to follow us. Now, I'm going to start with a brief introduction of the problem of CTE. This will be uh, a short introduction because we have uh, a lot of longer CTE presentations uh, on, on, our, uh, on our websites and YouTube, so those will be shared uh, with you. So if I can begin here, I wanna talk about the hidden issue of CTE in the military. Now, for those of you who don't know, well, you know what? I'm gonna switch something here. All right, you can see me all right here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I wanna give you a quick background, uh, which is, sorry, I have a little problem here technically. There we go. So I'm an accidental neuroscientist. So I got into this world um, through too many, taking too many hits to the head as a football player, then as a WWE wrestler. And just to give you a window into my uh, history, I took a few too many shots. Uh, garbage cans to the head, not advised. And that ended my career. And in researching post-concussion syndrome, I got very interested uh, in uh, both concussions and CTE and partnered with the doctor who's treating me, Dr. Robert Cantu, to start CLF back in 2007 to help change the culture uh, around concussions and to investigate this, this disease, CT, that we hadn't talked about. So our mission at the foundation is to support athletes, veterans, and all affected by concussions and CTE, achieve smarter sports and safer athletes through education and innovation, and to end CTE through prevention and research. 
And our vision is a world without CTE and concussion safety without compromise. We're honored to have all the veterans here today and those of you who care about veterans. I'm not a veteran, but I do care about veterans. That's a photograph of my father who was Lieutenant in the Army. Uh, he's still with us today, thank goodness. Um, and we're talking about two problems today. So most people are familiar with concussions and traumatic brain injuries. And that's sort of the, sometimes the inciting event um, for longer term problems. But it's a problem that we know about um, in the US is the signature wound of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. About 20% of returning veterans have suffered a TBI. That's over 400,000 service members. And the reality is concussions can derail a life causing problems with cognition, depression, anxiety, and even suicide. A couple of quick studies just to sort of lay the landscape that exists in the background beyond CTE is uh, concussion itself is a risk factor for dementia and it's also a risk factor for Parkinson's. So even in the absence of CT that we'll talk about, uh, concussions and TBIs are risk factors for long-term problems. And that also includes um, TBIs associated with suicidal ideation. One study of veterans showed the more concussions you had, the greater chances you had of suicidal ideation. And obviously this is a problem that we all care about very deeply. But the problem we're gonna talk about today is less discussed in the military population. And that's the, this disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is not a TBI, not a concussion. The concussions are, those are specific events. Um, that cause a brain injury, but the brain injury does not progress and keep going for decades and decades and decades. CTE is a, neuro, a neurodegenerative disease caused by brain trauma that results in similar symptoms, problems with cognition, mood, behavior, and sleep, and can also result in dementia. The issue with um, CTE is it's not just the big hits that cause it. In fact, in our studies of athletes, we don't see a relationship between the number of concussions you had and your chance of developing CT. The risk factor that we've identified for CTE is repetitive head impacts. So in sports, that might be how many times you're hitting the head is tackling someone in football or heading a ball in soccer. But for military, we're starting to, we're still trying to figure out those risk factors. Uh, and it could include, uh, you know, artillery, uh, 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 Jumping out of perfectly good airplanes, as my uh, paratroopers always tell me, there's a lot of risk factors that we haven't been tracking for repetitive trauma. It's very rare in the normal population, and the, uh, but we don't know how rare because we haven't yet learned how to diagnose it in living people. So what we mostly what we know is from our brain bank work, uh, and thanks to um, hundreds of families who have chosen to donate their brains of loved ones. Some of them are with us here today. So uh, what we've learned, I'm gonna share a little bit of the research from the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation, Foundation Brain Bank, um, which is the world's leading research program on CTE. We've had over 1200 brains donated since 2008. This is vast majority of the world's cases of this disease. Uh, luckily the NIH and VA have stepped up to fund this work. So we're starting to get uh, a little more uh, long-term security to keep this program going. And we've had lots of different publications in trying to understand this, this area. It's led by Dr. Anne McKee. Uh, she's the world's leader on this disease and uh, a leader on many other neurodegenerative diseases. She is a VA employee. Uh, and uh, you can see all her titles there, including being named uh, one of Time's 100 Most Influential People a few years back. And what she's taught us is that CTE, you can sort of think about a little bit like Alzheimer's disease. So on the left, you see a control brain. On the right, you see an Alzheimer's brain. You see two types of damage there, the brown and the red. The brown is this abnormal tau protein, basically the structural element of your cell has started to fall apart. Uh, the red is beta amyloid plaque, but that doesn't, that's not a big issue in CTE. Our first two NFL players uh, who had been hit in the head for 20 years, about a thousand times a year, they developed CTE and you can see it had some similarities to Alzheimer's disease. But in this next slide, you'll see that we've learned they're actually, uh, they're quite different. And we've been missing CTE in the public because look, if you look at the bottom at stage four, you can see that the disease has basically gone everywhere. And so you have global dysfunction of the brain and you have 
this term dementia. You can no longer take care of yourself. They both end up with dementia, but how, where the disease starts and the symptoms you have on your way to dementia are different. And CT is much more focused in the frontal lobes because that's what's uh, more vulnerable to repetitive head trauma and then spreads from there, whereas Alzheimer's starts deep in the brain, we don't even know exactly know why, and spreads outward. So, and it, we've also identified only as of 2015, the signature lesion of CTE, the specific thing you'd wanna find under our microscope to determine that this is CTE. So to show you an example of a, a full half hemisphere of a brain, so this is a brain sliced down the middle and about, sliced right about here, um, you see Dave Dewerson, a former NFL player whose family uh, lets us share this image where you see these brown spots sporadically throughout the brain, uh, we think starting around places of severe trauma and then spreading there to other parts of the brain. And those holes you see in the bottom images were blood vessels. So the disease is basically uh, two, there are sort of two signatures to it. One is you see these dark lesions at the bottom of the valleys of the brain. So you, your, your brain is full of gyri and sulci, the hills and valleys. At the bottom of the valleys are the most vulnerable parts of your brain uh, to trauma. So you twist the brain really quickly, the energy goes there and, and we think starts the damage. So that's what Dave Dewerson had. And then you see it around those holes, which are blood vessels. So you look for uh, the signature lesion there. This is a, a, one of our youngest, most severe cases where you see the same pattern of lesions uh, this was Aaron Hernandez, who's uh, well known in the United States because he had a, 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 a left the NFL in his early 20s uh, when he was arrested for murder uh, and then uh, died of suicide while in jail. So with military, uh, there's an added level of complexity because we know that TBI is an issue. We're beginning to understand a little bit about CTE, but there's also this PTSD a post-traumatic stress disorder that everyone's familiar with. And PTSD is a, a clinical diagnosis, right? So it's, you have symptoms uh, that you have your brain sort of malfunctioning from an experience. Um, and that change, there's a lot of symptomatic overlap with TBI, with CTE. And so we published uh, an abstract of a poster presentation, sort of the beginnings of our research a few years back where we identified that in our brain bank, in the Sensi brain bank, nine of the first 11 OEF, OIF veterans exposed to BLAST did meet diagnostic criteria for CTE. Their average age of death was 36. So that was concerning to find it that frequently in this small population. Um, also, this eight of nine had a, a diagnosis of PTSD. And what we're still trying to figure out is, was, was their PTSD diagnosis really capturing the concussion TBI CT symptoms, or was it capturing PTSD symptoms? And what is the overlap and how are they connected? And, we, and, and that's work that we need to figure out. We do know that TBI increases your likelihood of developing PTSD, but we still don't understand why. Um, one of the good news about uh, these research efforts is that there's finally been a brain bank started, the National PTSD Brain Bank in 2014, and Dr. Ann McKee leads one of those hubs. So all of our work trying to help Dr. Ann McKee unlock the mysteries of CT is also unlocking the mysteries of PTSD. And so to accelerate this, we started a program called Project Enlist uh, to serve as a catalyst for research uh, on military veterans with TBI, CT, and PTSD by increasing the number of veteran brain donations for research, right? Because what I've learned from doing this for 15 years is somebody who's has had TBI is likely gonna have, uh, or already has CTE, is that Brain bank research is, is essential for developing effective treatments for all of these issues. And we've been, uh, our work has been sort of widely embraced in the sports community, but there's not as much awareness about how essential brain donation is to help us figure out CT in the military. And so we're trying to create a culture of brain donation within the military community while also providing services to veterans through positive brain health messaging, meaning you've had TBI like me, if you're at risk for CT, it doesn't mean it's the end. It means this is just the beginning. There's still a lot of things you can control and we're gonna to work together to all live our best lives. Um, and strategically, it's important to appreciate that um, how, how important these numbers will be to getting services to veterans who are dealing with CTE. So this is a famous study that we published in, in 2017 um, on former NFL players. 
where we we publish it of the first 111 NFL players that we studied at the Brain Bank, 110 had CTE. Now that was a, a shocking percentage, and it also happened to be 10% of the NFL players who died over that period. And that got the world's attention and really helped drive services to football players and their families. And so there's now a lot of programs, some started by the NFL, the NFL PA and other groups that are helping NFL families that are dealing with this. Um, we haven't had that same, uh, those same numbers in the military that have allowed us to say to, to VSOs, to the VA, to the DOD, hey, CT is a, a huge problem in the military. I, I suspect it is. Our in early research suggests it might be, but we don't have the numbers to get everyone to the table to say, this is a problem we need to solve. So in the short term, we really want to help drive these brain donations to prove there's a problem so we can build these long-term solutions. It's harder to do for veterans as it is for athletes. Part of the reason that we're able to get so many NFL players' brains is that when they pass away, it becomes news in the sports media. And I literally will track down those family members within 48 hours of their passing. And the families almost always say yes, because they want to, they watch their loved ones struggle. They want answers. They're, they've been just so wonderful about this. But I don't have that surveillance system like I do with the sports media for military. When we hear about military veterans passing, it's often days later or weeks later. Um, and it's we don't have that time to get there within 48 hours to talk about brain donation. And so Project Enlist is also trying to create this surveillance system by asking veterans to donate their brain or to pledge to donate their brain. Because when the, if you were watching and you've pledged, I want you to live a long, healthy life, but we are all going to lose somebody. And when you've pledged, you'll think of if you lose somebody, you might think of connecting us to their family to make, make sure this research happens. And so that's really the vision of creating this surveillance system and asking veterans to pledge to donate their brain. And so that's CTE in the military in a nutshell. We don't yet know enough. We need to know a lot more. The early signs are that it is a, it is a problem there and, who, and we don't know the scale relative to sports, but we know it's there. And so this work that we're doing um, is designed to accelerate that. So Scott Wirt later on will give you a little bit more on Project Enlist and how we're doing it. But next, um, this work is really meant to drive how do we now learn how to diagnose this in living people so that we can start running clinical trials, so that we can start treating this disease. And so I'm very lucky um, to have one of the world's experts here who's trying to crack the code on how do we solve uh, diagnosing CT in living. So uh, I'm going to welcome Dr. Neil Vazdev. He's the director of the Brain Health Imaging Center at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and the director of the Azrieli Center for Neuroradiochemistry. Uh, he serves as the chief radiochemistry at CAMH, what we call Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and is the endowed Azrieli Chair in Brain and Behavior and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair, Chair in Radiochemistry and Nuclear Medicine. A lot of very impressive titles. His research focuses on developing and translating pet imaging agents to use in various brain-based illnesses. His work in this space has contributed to our shared goal of diagnosing CT in the living. Neil, I'll now turn it over to you to give us an overview of your exciting work. All right, uh, hope I can get everyone to see my slides. Great. All right, so thanks so much for the kind introduction, Chris, and uh, thank you all for taking the time to attend uh, the talks today. Chris really set the stage perfectly there with CTE being diagnosed upon autopsy. So what I would like to talk about today is how we use a medical imaging technique called PET, or positron emission tomography, to image the living human brain and to get to really our ultimate goal, which is to image CTE in life. And uh, just by way of uh, background, um, I also trained at uh, Massachusetts. I was the director of radiochemistry at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and I still hold a faculty appointment at Harvard Medical School. I joined there about 10 years ago. And right around that time was when I got connected to Ann McKee's program in BU and to Chris Nowinski and his team that were building out Concussion Legacy Foundation and going for the brain pledges. And really, they were the ones focusing on looking at the protein tau in the living human brain and also post-mortem. So there's 
obvious visible wounds of war from combat to training, things such as IED, uh, bl blast exposures, chemical exposures, and various activities. If there was a study that came out about five years ago it, for studies of Canadian military veterans who are, and people who are actively serving and looking at the activities associated with the most serious injuries. Interestingly, battle-related was about 7% of those injuries, but military training as well as the related sports, PT, and uh, adventure training was about it was over 50% of the injuries. Now, um, for example, people who are in the military, uh, specifically breachers, have an even higher exposure. And uh, just like Chris, I'm not a veteran, but I also have a family interest. My mother served in the Canadian military, the Canadian Armed Forces, for over 30 years, from 1977 to 2008. And uh, she also tells me about the stories of how rigorous the training was and Obviously, if people get injured, it was a lot about, you know, tough it out, just get back out there, don't worry about it, and uh, complete your trainings. Things like that are culture shifts that we're now seeing thanks to the efforts of places like the Concussion Legacy Foundation. And uh, the other big difference, too, being uh, a woman in the military, most of the research is done in men. So we're trying to start looking now at sex differences and start to see the difference between male and female athletes versus male and female uh, veterans. So these are, again, things that our laboratory is very interested in. Today's talk is going to be about the invisible wounds of war. And these include things such as severe psychological stressors, airborne pollutants and chemical exposures, often which are neurotoxins or things that cause inflammation in the brain. There's also a lot of other uh, mental health consequences that go with the traumatic brain injuries that Chris talked about. These can include everything from pain management, alcohol and substance abuse, sleep disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, which include things like sight, sounds, smells, and interpersonal uh, things such as grief. Often um, these are comorbid with anxiety, depression, suicide prevention, anger management, and as Chris mentioned, there is a big link between cognitive impairment and memory loss. There's actual um, links for higher rates of uh, or susceptibility for neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So we draw a lot of our information from the studies in aging research as well. Uh, well, I was in Boston. We collaborated with other teams, particularly run between the National Institutes of health and, uh, for example, uh, Stony Brook University in New York, and started looking at cognitive impairment and World Trade Center related exposures. This is a paper we just put out in Nature Reviews Neurology just uh, this month. And we found very similar correlations with people who've been at war and actual combat situations with, for example, World Trade Center related exposures and first responders. Now, as Tim mentioned, uh, sorry, as Chris mentioned, uh, traumatic brain injuries happen in life. This is when uh, he showed people get a head injury and you have everything from inflammation to other biological processes taking place. CTE is only uh, uh, diagnosed upon death, upon autopsy. For example, a healthy controlled brain is shown on the left and the patient with CTE is shown on the right. We see pathophysiological changes, including inflammation, upregulation of uh, tau, for example, that's a protein that I'll be talking about more in the future. And we have, all, again, all these symptoms from mood disorders to substance use to memory loss and aggression. So, is, so we currently collaborate with the Concussion Legacy Foundation and the Concussion Legacy Foundation of Canada, as well as the BU CTE Research Center, where they send us those brains that Chris mentioned he solicits from athletes, from veterans, victims of domestic abuse, and uh, acquire those brains so we can study them in our labs in Toronto. The person who's leading this work in our team is Cassis Varlau. She's a PhD candidate, as well as a research coordinator for the Concussion Legacy Foundation of Canada. This is um, Cassis's latest paper, which is just uh, in press this month, showing the brains she received from the Concussion Legacy Foundation and the CTE Bank in 
Boston, looking at markers of brain inflammation in healthy controls on the left and CTE one, two, and three, uh, one, two, and four going across the table. Again, uh, we're looking uh, at trying to come up with ways to get to our ultimate goal, which is to diagnose and, CT and treat CTE in the living brain and not have to rely on autopsy studies. So how can we do that? I'm just gonna show a little bit about uh, medical imaging technique that we use. And I think everybody's familiar with MRI and CT or CAT scanning, where a patient lies in a scanner and we get a nice image of their brain. Uh, ultimately, it's like an X-ray of the brain. We can see the structure. But what we're interested in is not just the structure, we're also interested in the function. And that's where we use a functional imaging method called positron emission tomography or PET. PET relies on using a radioactive source, which is injected in the body, patient lies in the scanner, and we can actually take an image of their brain in life. So I mentioned PET uses radioactivity. Now, what does that mean? I like to think of it the same way as the 15th century chemists used to try to turn base metals like iron uh, and other things into gold. We use a cyclotron, which is a particle accelerator to do that. This is a medical cyclotron. These are relatively small. They fit in the basement of our hospitals and we use them to accelerate particles at a very rapid rate. And we take stable elements like nitrogen or oxygen and convert them into radioactive carbon or radioactive fluorine and incorporate them into drugs. Here's an example of the most commonly used pet radio pharmaceutical. We start with radioactive fluorine, we hit the sugar, and we make a radioactive sugar called FDG. This is so streamlined now that everything is done remotely with robotic apparatus. When I learned to make FDG, it was all done by hand, but the uh, technologies have really changed throughout, and now we're able to manufacture similar to how a pharmaceutical is manufactured. Once a patient lies in the scanner, there's a ring of detectors, and it's these coincident lines that are used to give PET its excellent uh, sensitivity and resolution. This is an example of a patient with FD, uh, after injection of FDG. You see radioactivity in the brain, heart, kidneys, and bladder. It's a normal individual. In the case of somebody with cancer, most of PET imaging is actually used for cancer. You'll see a baseline scan where you can see all the black lesions in here, these are cancerous tumors. And after chemotherapy in an ideal situation, you see that the scan goes back to those baseline conditions where you just see the radioactive sugar in the places where one would expect it for a sugar, brain, heart, kidneys, and bladder. Now the dopaminergic pathway is something else that we're very interested in because as Chris mentioned, there is an increased risk for neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's disease. For those of you who've seen the movie Awakenings, where uh, Robin Williams um, and uh, Robert De Niro, they is, uh, the gist of the story is that uh, they're treating patients that are catatonic. They cannot move. Their dopamine levels are so low that they can't actually move. From the So what they do is they give them a compound called L-DOPA, because you can't just give dopamine. That's what you're trying to raise the levels of, because dopamine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But if you give the metabolic precursor, L-DOPA, crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets converted to dopamine, and raises those levels, and takes people who can't move to be able to walk around freely. Now, uh, this is a bit of um, uh, so the Canadian history here, showing the cover page of Nature in 1983, where they realize, they visualized dopamine in the living human brain. And this was the pet center director at the time, Dr. Steve Garnett laid in the scanner. It was my PhD advisor, uh, Raman Chirikov, who made the dose and they injected him. And you see this beautiful uptake in the healthy control brain. This is the striatum where the majority of dopaminergic neurons are known to be present. You can see here a patient with Parkinson's disease and it's a dramatic reduction. What was exciting about the study is it shaped, dopamine imaging shaped PET because it allowed functional imaging to be realized for the first time. And it also shaped the field of chemistry. It showed that we could make specifically radio labeled molecules and use them to target the brain. Now, um, uh, so again, the time that I got connected with Chris and Anne McKee and others from uh, Boston was 
when I was in uh, working alongside uh, Dr. Keith Johnson, who was leading the Harvard Aging Brain Study. This is where they looked at thousands of subjects with a radioactive tracer developed in Pittsburgh called Pittsburgh Compound B or PIB. On the left is a normal 75 year old subject with low levels of amyloid. That's what this radio tracer detects. On the right is a age matched person, a patient suffering from Alzheimer's disease, dementia. If every scan distinguished between Alzheimer's and normal uh, subject with that uh, sensitivity, we wouldn't need anything else. But the reality is we've got this high cohort of individuals who are normal, but just happen to have high amyloid. Gen getting amyloid in the brain is a normal part of aging. So we desperately need more sensitive biomarkers, new tracers, new targets, and new radiochemical methods to address these problems. Now, there are three FDA approved radiopharmaceuticals now for Alzheimer's disease, but none of them are ideal and none of them are good for imaging Alzheimer's disease at an early stage. Um, as Chris mentioned, Alzheimer's disease, we start by looking at plaques, but we're really interested in another protein called tau. Also, so this is something that I got involved in in Boston too, where we patented the method for a tracer that was developed by Siemens Molecular Imaging Biomarkers and acquired by Avid and a company, and then Eli Lilly eventually bought them over. This was uh, FDA approved within the last two years, and it's a tracer now known as Tauvid, which is again uh, being used in multicenter clinical trials. We had a nice 10 year head start with Tauvid, having developed it in Boston. And the exciting part of this is, as Chris showed earlier from the post mortem data, the amyloid scans as you go from mild cog cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease, you really start seeing the plaque load increase. But we have a different distribution when we start looking at tau protein where the tracer starts and spreads to this uh, neocortical region, which is also relevant to CTE. Again, there's been a lot of press about uh, head injuries in athletes. A lot of this was also brought to the media with the movie concussion where Will Smith plays a neurologist or a neuropathologist known as Bennett, who's actually uh, named uh, Bennett Alamalu, who really started looking at postmortem brains of athletes, football players, boxers, and uh, others who play contact sports. This is from his postmortem data that they identified tau protein, not only in contact sports, but also people who've suffered accidents, including vehicle accidents, victims of domestic abuse, and military veterans. Of course, uh, once we had this radio tracer working in Alzheimer's disease, this caught the attention of the NFL, the US Department of Defense, as well as other sporting organizations, including the uh, NHL CFL. That's where we started partnering with Concussion Legacy Foundation and now Concussion Legacy Foundation of Canada and Canadian National Defense. If um, this was again, the very first images we had, which was again, very exciting. The bottom two subjects are just controls. And the top two were very young NFL players. This is uh, one showing a hot spot here from the PET scan in the cell side. This is between the gray and the white matter. And this is consistent with the neuropathology study that we saw from Chris's introduction talk. So again, to see um, evidence of CTE in life was a really big finding. And again, this is what really sparked a lot of that research. This has been going on all over the world now. We, this is an example of some work being led by my colleague, Dr. Carmela Tartaglia in Toronto. She's, she's separating the groups as tau positive athletes versus tau negative athletes. And you can clearly see between ages of 30 to 60, there's a higher uh, uptake in the tau positive athletes than the negative ones. And then different treatment options and strategies can be employed. We're also very interested in brain inflammation. So we have new radioactive tools to look at brain inflammation. This is some work being led by my colleague, Dr. Isabel Boileau, looking at military veterans with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder. And a lot of these veterans not only have PTSD, but they have a comorbidity for major depressive disorder. So this is an interesting kind of imaging study that we're looking in, in Canadian Armed Forces uh, veterans right now. Just again, in sort of to wrap up, so we can have some time for discussion, I just thought I'd let everyone know that what else can we do with PET? 
in military populations. So one thing we can do is determine the dose of new therapeutics. We can assess the distribution of a new or existing drug that targets tau or neuroinflammation or is designed to clear tau or clear inflammation from the brain. We can also confirm the target engagement of these new drugs as well and treatment therapy. So we can monitor treatment regression as well. Our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to image CT in life, but um, there's a lot of challenges, brain injuries. Not only do you just have the brain injury to deal with, but you also have the other mental health consequences, which certainly um, make the situation more complicated. Also, uh, no traumatic brain injuries are going to be the same. Everybody's going to experience different levels of impacts, frequencies, durations, everything, and level of impacts. There's also sex differences that haven't been discovered or studied well at this time. Another reason, uh, something that we've been working on in our lab is to look at the difference of different enzymes in Alzheimer's disease and to start looking at male and female brains. We have this new partnership formalized as of uh, last a few weeks ago between our CAMH Brain Health Imaging Center and the Concussion Legacy Foundation of Canada. This is a new strategy to start recruiting Canadian veterans and Canadian athletes uh, for new studies at the center in Toronto. And we also have many active methods for developing PET radiopharmaceuticals for traumatic brain injuries and neurodegenerative diseases that we believe will help pave the way for new treatment options and diagnosis options. It's a quick summary of our center. For those of you who haven't seen it, again, welcome anybody to come visit us. Uh, I think our restrictions are lifting in the next couple of weeks. And we are the first positron emission tomography center in Toronto, a little over 30 years in existence and the largest facility in North America dedicated solely to mental health and addiction. We have two particle accelerators or cyclotrons two radio pharmaceutical production labs. We have about 40 PET radio tracers in human use, and half of those are developed from bench to bedside for first in human studies. We have preclinical imaging. We have uh, first in human, which we can do a lot of the neuropathology as well. We're an expert site for first in human studies. We have two clinical scanners and an MRI unit. Um, in the near future, we're gonna be moving to this new building. This was a video, but it's not, oh, there it's showing now. It's a, uh, it's going to be shaped like a brain, and it's going to be a state-of-the-art building that uh, between the hospital and the government and donors are now chipping in to make this the state-of-the-art facility for brain imaging in, in the, the world. That's the idea, and it's going to be even bigger than our existing facility. The, uh, so again, uh, it's meant to look at the two hemispheres of the brain. The staircase in the middle is, called the corpus, is supposed to be like the corpus callosum, with, which connects the two the left and the right side of the brain. We want to definitely make a major thanks to all our sponsors and people who funded us throughout, including a recent gift from a family to build our facility and to introduce our newest partner relevant to this call is uh, CLFC. I also just want to thank the CLFC and the CLF and the organizing committee, as well as our past and present teams who've been working on the research that I showed you today. And I want to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Vasta. That was tour de force. That was well done. Uh, so we're getting some questions in the chat. I will read them for you and you can answer them. Um, so Arash started with, have you seen any interesting Talvid patterns in the brain from serial imaging the same individual over time? Okay, so um, just for full disclosure, I'm not a physician, so um, I rely on uh, the physician scientists to generate all the data. So any opinion that I give is uh, based on just the imaging data at this point. <laughs> so that's my disclaimer, but uh, yeah, absolutely. There are longitudinal studies, multi-center clinical trials going on using Talvid uh, at sites all over, all over the world, actually. So um, the biggest challenge right now is getting a high enough uh, statistical number. It's not gonna be as clear cut as something like Parkinson's disease where you say, we know it's low dopamine, so we're gonna look for just dopamine in the brain here. We've got comorbidities, we've got different types of head injuries and like I mentioned, sex differences. So these studies are underway. They are seeing trends that I think are definitely significant. Some of that work is obviously being done in Toronto too with um, Carmela Tartaglia's lab for the athletes and Isabel Boilo's lab for military veterans. I think 
uh, it's just going to take a bit more. We need a longer runway of time to really see the differences. And Talvid only was FDA approved in 2020. So I'm expecting that way more sites are going to be generating a lot of data soon too. So there are these whole studies about big data and um, neuroinformatics that are also looking for these patterns based on the data that's being generated and shared in the open science literature. Great. So there's a, a good question here. And I have you seen differences between brain injury and long-term effects between blast injury and direct impact injury? Um, so that again is another challenging one because um, blast injuries can be also very subjective in a sense, like if somebody's at the ground of uh, like say at uh, right near an IED or a blast is going to be different than the shock waves experienced by somebody else. It's a lot of the shock waves or being in a military vehicle that's near a blast and the impact of being uh, knocked around, for example, in a military vehicle can also be very, very different. So this is why I think these patterns are going to depend. And also there are two things that are going to really look for those trends with proper statistics. One of them is enrolling more people in for these PET scans, which again is an expensive and time consuming process, but also having more and more brains donated so they can be studied post-mortem at many laboratories to start looking at those effects. But uh, there are definitely differences. So right now there's no model of this. The only model that we can do, other diseases might even have an animal model. We don't have that a reliable animal model for something like this because uh, the disease is so, so unique. And each person's head injuries are so unique. And the exposures that they're getting are completely unique. So this is a human model study that all the data is being generated from. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'll ask one of my team members to put Dr. Lee Goldstein's uh, 20, 2018 study in the chat, uh, so a, a program that we funded, uh, partially funded, was much, much larger, um, where there, he does outline some of the differences in a mouse model between uh, impact injury and blast injury. Basically, uh, the conclusion being a blast doesn't often cause, uh, as often cause the can, acute symptoms, but still both can lead to long-term CT issues in mice. But as Dr. Vazdev said, very differently shaped brain. So it doesn't translate like we'd like it to. Uh, a couple of questions I could bucket together. Um, are PET scans you know, ready for prime time? Do people want to go to the doctor and say, I want a PET scan if they're concerned about CTE? Um, I'm saying yes, for sure. So um, a couple of my friends have already signed up for some of the studies that we have here that have played, uh, they played high level hockey or soccer uh, and are starting, have noticed certain things like memory loss and headaches and various other things that have impacted their life from post-concussive syndrome. And they're looking to, give back to the community and help future generations learn about brains, but also potentially benefit from treatments. I think for PET too, like having tau is definitely a plus, but we, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. We do need multi-tracer studies. See, Alzheimer's disease is very complicated because there's many hypotheses and many different drug treatments and there's many different pathways that are involved. So it's gonna be the same, I think, with CTE. We're not just gonna be able to just look at tau. In certain cases, we might look for example, if tau is comorbid, if a person has head injuries and major depressive disorder, it would be a different treatment outcome than say, for example, head injuries that have led to addictions as well, and or um, somebody experiencing sleep um, uh, issues and other things too. So I think it's gonna be more custom tailored. Right now, once we get all the data with tau, we're gonna have to think about other ways to concurrently measure levels, for example, uh, yeah, for any of those types of yeah. comorbidities. Yeah, and so one important thing to mention, your, your standard, your average, your doctor, your treating neurologist doesn't have access to the tools that Dr. Vazdev is developing. So he talks about getting a PET scan. Yes, for one of these research studies that's ongoing using PET. 
especially CAMH. So we, um, we're going to put into the chat right now our clinical research registry. Someone asked about where do you sign up? So uh, join our clinical research registry and we'll follow, we will send you information on how to sign up for this study and every study when we're, when we're ready to go uh, full speed ahead. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, I guess another question is always asked, so I'll ask it a different way. Um, you know, how far away is a CT diagnosis in life? My question would be how far away, if you, if, if you learn you have the tool right now, that you've developed the right tracer, how far away would it be? And what do you think the odds of success are that this is the right one versus you know, next generation? So that's something we're actually working on right now. So almost all the tracers for tau are optimized for Alzheimer's disease because just Alzheimer's disease is really considered to be the next pandemic. It's a socioeconomic burden and burden on individuals and their family and the healthcare system are just enormous. It's in the trillions of dollars. So, and expecting to continue as we have an aging population. So everybody in terms of the pharma companies and everybody is working on Alzheimer's disease, but AD tau is different than CTE tau. So what our lab is working on right now is um, working on making tracers that are specific to the uh, ISO forms of tau, which is, um, for example, Alzheimer's tau is considered to be a mixed 3R and 4R tauopathy, whereas um, CTE tau is, um, could, like we're making now tracers that are selected for 3R tau and 4R tau. So it's it's concurrent with drug development and it's concurrent with specifically dedicated efforts to make imaging agents for imaging CTE tau in vivo. So that is ongoing, um, not only at our lab, but at several around the world. But it's relatively recent that people are starting to work on this. So, and certainly behind the field in Alzheimer's. Can you so, speak to I think it'll take some time. Yeah, it'll take some time. Yeah, yeah, yeah it'll we... take some time. Be... Yeah, go ahead. But a big step is having the FDA approval of tau because that's the first tau pet radiopharmaceutical approved for right now for Alzheimer's. But that that's a big step. So right now everything is clinical research, but I think we're not too far from clinical pet given the number of trials and people testing tau clearing drugs and other therapeutics. Yeah, and part part of our strategy at the foundation is let's keep recruiting scientists like Dr. Bastev and do whatever we can to make his life easier, so he can, you know, aim his brilliance at this disease. So whether it's recruiting patients or whether it's making sure that he has access to brain tissue, you know, it's important to support him. Uh, and speaking of supporting you, uh, someone asked, can can you speak to the requirements to be accepted into the study as a veteran? Um, actually, anybody can be accepted into the study. Um, for example, like my mother was never deployed uh, as a reserve force um, a veteran, but they're looking for the whole spectrum, right? We're looking for people who haven't been deployed to compare with those who were uh, in combat situations. So any veteran can apply. And because CTE has so many different stages, like CTE one, two, three, four that we know today, there's a whole spectrum that has to be looked at. So all the data, the better. Um, my mother has pledged her brain for a project and list as well. So really looking for brains of veterans to be pledged as well as um, people to volunteer for the PET scans at any stage. That also includes athletes. I saw one of the questions, is there a difference between athletes and military populations? Actually, I think they're very similar because often the military selects athletic people or people with a predisposition to be uh, you know, driven towards athletics and PT and um, the exercise regimens are very prominent in the training of veterans. So you end up seeing very similar populations, uh, a lot of overlap in there. You have to be Canadian for your study? No. Hey, come on over. <laughs> Uh, thanks, John Gall. Good to hear, glad you're here. Um, all right, uh, Jack Hardy asks, does the imaging take place at regular intervals or after a specific event? Uh, for, it, for can, it can be any. Um, yeah, any. No, uh, to make a, it's literally from people who played high level sports may not have even had a notable concussion or maybe just had several subconcussive hits and no specific incident all the way to multiple concussions with them. 
you know, with uh, obvious uh, side of, like uh, okay. with, with obvious uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I went blank there, but uh, yeah. uh, obvious uh, signs of post concussive syndrome. That's where I was thinking. Great. Okay. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap there to move on to the next section. But Dr. Vastep, thank you so much uh, for that great presentation, great Q and A. We're really, uh, really proud to work with you. And thank you for your hard work. Thanks again. Pleasure to work with you too. And looking forward to uh, everything. And thanks again for all your support with our programs as well. Yeah. And I look forward to getting back up to Toronto to see you. Looking forward to it too. All right. Um, so next, as you know, the only way that we can learn about CTE is, is right now uh, and diagnosed as through brain based research. So after finding success through our brain, brain, pledge aware, excuse me, brain pledge awareness campaigns and athletes all over the last decade, we knew we wanted to launch a similar effort in the military community. And so that's project to the list. And we were honored to launch it a few years ago in the US and more recently in Canada. But now I'd like to bring in Scott Wirt, our new military program manager to provide an overview of the program. So Scott joined us in December following 20 years of service in the U.S. Marine Corps. His, uh, during his military career, Scott deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan as part of Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Scott served primarily as a telecommunications officer, but started his service as a machine gunner and ended it with additional specialties in space operations, joint operations, and technical operations. So we're proud to have you. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, all my friends used to tease me that I was a space marine, like in uh, a couple of the movies you've seen in the past, but I appreciate it. Uh, and I uh, just want to build off what you presented a little earlier, and I'd like to go a little more in depth about what Project in the List entails. Uh, so I think you touched on this one, you know, obviously there's a, we need to understand this better in, in the veteran and military space. Um, and if you look at the numbers, the VA uh, does say it's 414,000 service members that have been diagnosed with TBI uh, during the global war on terror, which is, as we know, is probably a low, uh, a low number because not all of them, all the uh, TBIs are, are reported. And uh, I've already spoke to many veterans that ha have not had it in their service records. Um, we see that veterans are exposed to TBI at higher risk. They're exposed to, and they're at a higher risk of depression, anxiety. So all these things play into each other, as you mentioned earlier, PTSD, um, and trying to separate them is important for us to understand. And then, you know, the first nine of 11 OEF, OIF veterans uh, met the criteria for CTE. So um, very much like when you started looking at NFL uh, brains. It's, um, it's very similar when we started getting the higher percentages there. Uh, the mission of Project Enlist, I think you've touched on this as well, but the mission is really be a catalyst of research on TBI, CTE, uh, PTSD, and veteran communities so that we can develop effective treatment for these conditions. But additionally, we, we need to change the culture around recognizing and reporting brain trauma, as well as the veteran, um, as veteran willingness to pledge and donate their brains so that we can help future generations of veterans uh, that will face uh, these challenging conditions. And then earlier, you know, Chris mentioned our strategic short-term goal for Project Enlist. Uh, so I just want to touch on that real quick, but 100 CTE cases among veterans by 2025. And we need to have some the same conversation that the 110 of 111 NFL brains caused about our current service members and veterans and their long-term health and quality of life. So due to the lack of media attention for veterans, um, the passing of a professional athlete receives, a major part of Project Enlist is centered on boots on the ground surveillance system uh, approach where veterans and current service members help spread the word about Project Enlist to our brothers and sisters that have served and answered the call. Uh, the surveillance network really can also help us receive brain donations in a timely manner if a fellow service member or veteran passes away. And that's what I wanted to uh, show here on this slide. And that is, um, this is a case uh, with Ron Condry's uh, donation uh, from his wife, Nicole. Ron, I mean, he was a hero. You can take a look at the slide. He's a hero in every sense of the word. 14 deployments uh, deployed with Navy SEALs, multiple occasions, obviously. Uh, a very active afterwards working with veterans uh, after retirement. So. 
Um, I mean, just a, a magnificent individual, but unfortunately he did die by suicide in 2018. And as we hear all too often, it's, um, you know, he struggled with PTSD and, and um, you know, things that came from uh, TBIs. Uh, being EOD, he was high risk. So um, in this instance, however, you know, the template for our service, our, our surveillance system was born um, really due to the quick thinking of our veteran advisory board member, Lieutenant Jason Redman. Jason had known Ron and his wife, Nicole, through their careers in the Navy. And when he heard of Ron's passing, he decided to reach out to Nicole and facilitate uh, the brain donation of Ron's brain. And Nicole, um, you know, was, was willing to do that and uh, has since been a very vocal um, spokesperson for uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation and Project Enlist and is on our Veterans Advisor Board now. Uh, you can also read about Ron's story in American Legion article that was that highlighted it uh, and Project Enlist. And uh, we just wanted to point this out here because, you know, um, this type of article is also something that helps us get the word out and uh, something that, uh, you know, working with veteran service organizations is very important. And, um, and this uh, generated several uh, brain pledges uh, around the veteran community. So that was I think one of our highest months there. Um, and then Sergeant Kevin Ash was, uh, uh, was really our, our inspiration for Project Enlist. Um, Joy is, I know his mother Joy is on uh, watching the webinar now and I, I thank you Joy for all your support and uh, your continued support and um, outspokenness and uh, willing to get the word out about this. Um, and unfortunately, what Joy had to go through um, to get to this point uh, uh, is w was not um, something anybody wants to go through with their with their uh, family member, or their especially their child. Um, but like I said, he was an inspiration for Project Enlist and one of our first veteran brain donate, uh, donations. Uh, he was exposed to twelve combat blasts, which is uh, exceedingly high number of combat blasts through his deployments. Um, and he was the subject of a 60 minutes feature in 2018, as you can see, and he helped us begin the conversation about CT in the military community. Uh, on this slide, just really wanted to point out that um, we really uh, do not have the number of veteran brain donations that we, we need to get after this problem. Um, and you can see that we have fewer than 50 veteran brains uh, with, uh, with, without contact sports specifically. Um, as Dr. Bazdev mentioned, we do get a lot of uh, um, veterans that have played prior sports because that's just the nature of the recruiting uh, efforts that, and the people who end up signing up for military service. Um, but we need a larger pool and that's to do the research to understand um, these complications, you know, caused by TBIs and CTE and and PTSD, and how do we separate those things? I really wanted to get after on this slide, just you know, what we can do as veterans. And I think we had a few um, we had a few questions earlier, looking at uh, what can we do to get the word out. Uh, one is you can pledge to donate your brain at projectenlist.org if you're in the U.S. or projectenlist.ca in Canada. Uh, two, we have Operation Brain Health and Operation Brain Health is really, uh, as Chris said earlier, we would love for veterans to pledge their brains uh, to donate, but we want you to live a happy and healthy life and have a good quality of life. And when it's time that <laughs> we don't we don't want your brains now, we want it when it's time. And so what we wanna do now for veterans is, uh, is op use Operation Brain Health to kind of help educate uh, those um, that are maybe suffering from one of these conditions uh, and, and to help get the word out and help change the, cult the culture around um, brain health in the military. So Operation Brain Health does those, uh, does those things. It gives you some things to look at, some things to read, some links. Um, and that's just a good way to uh, learn and understand uh, what you or your fellow service members may, have, may be going through. And then three, reach out to CLF, the CLF helpline. Either if you are struggling with uh, symptoms from concussions or TBIs, uh, suspected CTE, please reach out to our helpline. 
uh, or if you have friends, uh, fellow service members, fellow veterans that you speak to on a regular basis or that you're, you know, we all have that community of, uh, of, of fellow service members that we uh, have served with in the past or that we've met along the way after retiring or, or separating. And uh, this is a, a great helpline, great resources that CLF has built over the years of helping um, people with these uh, the symptoms or signs of, of these specific conditions. And we're building that out with some veteran specific um, um, resources as well. Some different uh, um, partners like the Wounded Warrior Project and their Warrior Care Network um, and, and several others. And so I just wanna encourage that if, if you need help now, uh, reach out to that helpline. And then lastly on this slide, uh, facilitate brain donation. I spoke about the surveillance network that we are building, and this is where it comes into play on a very um, you know, big stage. And that is, uh, if you know of someone who has passed away, um, that is when to reach out to CLF uh, and potentially get them to pledge or donate their uh, loved one's brains. And so um, that's important uh, because that's the best way that we have found with veterans is that tight knit community um, to get the donations is is by uh, reaching out and being that boots on the ground surveillance network. And then just for uh, how to get involved with non veteran individuals, we know there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that uh, are not veterans specifically, but they have family members that are or were or for close friends. Um, there are a couple of ways to also get involved with obviously donating money to Project Enlist. And you can see the link there with classy.org. Uh, um, you can also pledge to donate your brain. Uh, we need, uh, I think as Dr. Vazdev said earlier, we need everyone. And so uh, we need people who have served, we need people who uh, haven't and uh, the brain bank has all sorts of uh, um, people who are from different walks of life and uh, so you can also pledge to donate your brain as well and then uh, connect us with individuals or veteran service organizations we're always looking to connect with uh, um, individuals that may have a, a keen interest in this um, through family or, or or other veterans you may know or uh, veteran service organizations that um, are trying to tackle the same conditions that we are, uh, you know, suicide is, is big, is a big um, thing right now. You hear the 22 suicides a day for veterans and you hear the, the propensity, uh, high propensity for suicide amongst veterans. And so there's a lot of people in this space at different places that, or, or organizations that, uh, that want to be a part of this. And so we're just trying to link up with them to get the word out so we can serve all veterans. And then for organizations, uh, there's a couple ways that uh, they can get involved as well. Um, obviously, I'd mentioned veteran service organizations. We can do, and then there's also uh, corporations or uh, other uh, veteran affiliated businesses or just businesses that are um, kind of veteran oriented. Uh, and so there's a couple ways to do this. Either one, become a, pro a project enlist program partner, which really helps us kind of collaborate to get the word out about project enlist. Um, and, and reach more veterans uh, for pledges. And then number two, uh, become a funding partner. Uh, I'd mentioned Wounded Warrior Project. They have uh, been a foundational partner for um, Project Enlist and as well as DAV uh, and, and several others. Right now you can see this is uh, our uh, several contributors or several program partners and, and uh, funding partners that we have for Project Enlist in the United States. And I know there's uh, several others for the Canadian side of the house as well. Um, but for more information about this, you can see my uh, email address there at the bottom of that slide. Please reach out to me and uh, we'll, we'll facilitate um, everything that needs to happen on that front. All right, uh, that's the main portion of the brief that I wanted to give. Um, but really what I wanna move on to now is uh, we're excited to welcome Major General Dennis Thompson to share his experiences with us. And uh, Dennis served 39 years in the Canadian Army, deploying on multiple operations at home and abroad in Cyprus and Germany, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Egypt. Uh, since his retirement, he has been a periodic lecturer 
at several universities, as well as a senior mentor and instructor at the Canadian Forces College in Toronto. He is a fellow at the University of Manitoba's Center for Defense and Security Studies and remains in service as the Colonel of the Regiment for the Royal Canadian Regiment. Dennis, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Scott. And uh, can I first start by thanking Chris and, uh, and Dr. Neil uh, Vazdev for the invitation and, and the excellent presentations that I've seen so far. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's been great so far, and this is a good, great week for uh, uh, to, to get the word out about Project Enlist on, on both fronts, and I'm glad that we can work with our Canadian partners and, and build that tight affiliation. Um, throughout your career, you've assumed many leadership positions, and it's only fitting that you continue to this trend as a vocal leader for Project Enlist in Canada. Uh, to start our conversation, could you give our audience a brief background on your experience in the Canadian Army and why you agreed to play such an integral role in Project Enlist Canada? It's a valid question. Thanks, Scott. Well, I think, as you mentioned, I served 39 years. I was in the infantry in the Royal Canadian Regiment, for which I'm the, the uh, colonel of the regiment now, which is an honorary position. Don't worry, I'm not still carrying a rifle at 60 years old. I had an opportunity to command at the platoon, company, battalion, brigade task force. I was commander Canada Special Operations Forces. And as you mentioned, uh, I commanded a multinational force in Egypt. Uh, and th that's a great honor and it's certainly a great responsibility. The operations I was uh, engaged in span the gamut from classic peacekeeping to deterrence as a cold warrior, which is what we did in Germany, to domestic counterterrorism contingencies after 9-11, uh, up to counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, and of course, operations in the presence of non-state actors, which is the code word for Islamic State. Uh, and it, as you mentioned, this brought me to many overseas locations like Germany, Cyprus, Bosnia, various places in Africa, Afghanistan, and Egypt. Every operation and each country has their own specificities, and the risks to the soldiers, however, remain the same. And I classify them in three ways, because you know we like to think keep things simple in the infantry. First, it's army sports, that's a risk. Second, it's live fire training, as has already been mentioned. And third, and perhaps more, most dangerously, is actual combat. So for me, army sports was rugby. And I played rugby from the time I was in military college, which is our Royal Military College, the Canadian equivalent of West Point, and into my 50s. And while I suffered the usual knocks like everyone else, cracked ribs, etc., I was admitted once to the hospital after suffering a concussion that rendered me unconscious. I stayed there for a night of observation and was released, as I say, into the wild without any useful advice about the cumulative effects of uh, that concussion and any previous ones I may have suffered. Uh, so that's, that's the first one. The second is live fire training, and that involves, as you know well, Scott, uh, the use of all manner of weapons in, at their wartime settings. And that means that these powerful weapons are fired in close proximity to soldiers. It could be as simple as an 84 millimeter Carl Gustav recoilless weapon to the 25 millimeter Bushmaster on a lab to the main gun on a tank. Uh, and they're fired from hastily prepared positions and often fired in volleys. So you might consider that it's the firer and those people participating in the exercise that are at highest risk. But in fact, that's not the case. It's the safety staff who have to follow these, uh, these soldiers and will have to do these events perhaps a half dozen times, half dozen live fire events in a single training day. And so speaking from experience, I can tell you that the blast wave alone, and, and I know that uh, Neil was trying to differentiate between the different types of uh, blast effects and concussive effects, but the blast wave alone will take your breath away each and every time. And that's in the army. If I speak to our Special Operations Forces operators, they are continually exposed to the effects of blast during explosive entry training, among other events. And then finally, the third bit is, of course, there's combat. And nothing can truly prepare you for the multiplicity of effects that will hit you in battle. And perhaps our biggest concern was the dreaded, as you know, improvised explosive device, or IED. It caused multiple casualties during my uh, time as the commander of Task Force Kandahar in Afghanistan and, and even in Egypt. And as an example, my tactical headquarters, which was a LAV-3, a light armored vehicle three, traveled 16,500 kilometers throughout the province of Kandahar in 2008-9. And therefore, I unfortunately was in close proximity to many IED events. 
but thankfully my vehicle was never directly hit. I can relate just one incident where an RG34, which is a, a 13 ton mine resistant vehicle, I believe in the US it's referred to as an MRAP, uh, detonated an IED and only lost its right rear wheel. Uh, I, I turned up at the incident site minutes later, talked to one soldier as he was dismounting from the, this vehicle, the RG as we called it, and seeing that all was well, uh, they decided that they were gonna stay in the vehicle and carry on in another vehicle. Now I relate this story because years later, I spoke to that same soldier and he told me that he doesn't recall anything immediately post blast. And that includes his chat with his commanding general, me. And I think that that's uh, pretty indicative of the sorts of things we put our soldiers through. So why do I, did I agree to play a role to, to answer your question more deliberately? Because I can see that the Concussion Legacy Foundation, both in the US and Canada, is willing to play a role in fixing this recurring problem. First, and you've already mentioned these, Scott, but I'll just go through them quickly, through education. There is a program that I know is, uh, is evident in sports called Team Up Speak Up that we're trying to sell here amongst the Canadian Armed Forces. Second, by providing accessible resources through the helpline or the hotline that uh, CLFC runs up here in Canada. And third, and I think what we're really talking about today is research through Project Enlist. So that in a nutshell, and I probably prattled on too long, which is a tendency that general officers have, is why I got involved. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, very relatable. Uh, and But I would say that that, that uh, soldier had probably, uh, you can tell he's speaking the truth because usually when you forget a conversation with a general officer in the field, it's uh, something's going wrong. So I appreciate you relaying that story. Uh, why did you... Uh, decide to pledge your brain specifically? Well, when I retired, I decided I was going to implicate myself in a whole number of causes that benefit veterans. Um, and at one point, I bumped into a former captain from my regiment, a gentleman named Ryan Carey. He's, uh, he as well got out at the rank of captain, and, uh, and, and he explained to me the good works that were being conducted by the Concussion Legacy Foundation in Canada. And those, let's be frank here, they were being executed under the executive leadership of a gentleman named Tim Fleiser, who's also a former professional football player and a friend of, of, of Chris Nowinski's. And I knew that when I spoke to those two gentlemen that I had a worthy cause. So Tim and Ryan convinced me and they were very convincing salesmen, but frankly, the cause was an easy sell. Uh, anything that can reduce the incidence of post-concussive effects to a minimum, I think is a good uh, cause to, 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 to follow. I also learned all about CTE, which I had absolutely no idea about, and, and the likely effect of repetitive minor traumatic brain injuries and other traumatic brain injuries. So, so it only stood to reason that not only would I give a voice to this worthy cause, but I would also offer up my brain uh, with its limited capacity. Uh, we have a saying in my regiment, don't ask a soldier to do something you're not willing to do yourself. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah, that makes complete sense, sir. Yeah, leadership doesn't stop once you retire or uh, decide to separate. And I think that's very uh, evident amongst veterans. And I, it's a, that's a great message there. Um, can you touch on the importance of kind of bringing veterans together like Ryan has done? I know Mike uh, as well with him uh, working on the Canadian side uh, to kind of move the message forward and make a meaningful impact. Uh, well, I think the best response to your question, and and it's unfortunate that Allison's not here to to give her um, her her not evidence, but her to relate her experiences in addition to Ryan and of course Mike, who you mentioned. Um, it's, be it's best to get their point of view in, in a sense, because I'm not egotistical enough to believe that veterans will follow my example as a general officer. After all, once we leave the military, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth here, Scott, but once we leave the military, we rejoice in the lack of overbearing generals banging on about what we should or should not do. Thus, while I'm happy to stump for CLFC, and, and I try to help more at the, at the executive level, inside the government of Canada with the connections that I still have, it amongst veterans, it's really the veterans at grassroots that are pivotal, pivotal in convincing others that a program like Project Enlist is absolutely uh, worth 
signing up to. And this is what I believe uh, in terms of a veterans network, people like Mike, Ryan and Allison's true value added is their connection to the wider veteran community is arguably more genuine uh, than mine. I mean, let's be honest, they, they have a more visceral connection to serving and retired soldier than some old general seemingly reimposing his will on his former charges. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that candid response. Uh, and that, you know, there is, I think it's a multi-level effort and what we're seeing now and some of your work with the government and in your circles is very, is just as important. And then we have, like you said, you know, Ryan's and the mics of the world that can uh, really re relate to them at the, at the boots on the ground level and, uh, and do that very well. So thank you. And uh, I think just one last question. Um, if you could say one thing to a fellow veteran who's struggling with TBI or PTSD or CTE symptoms right now, what would you say? Well, I think, uh, all soldiers appreciate gallows humor. So uh, I think the first thing I'd say to them is, you know, what do you need your brain for in the afterlife <laughs> and see how, uh, how they take that. And with that as a hook, I think it is best to emphasize how their brain donation is the ultimate expression of solidarity with their battle buddies, because that's really, you know, that's who we think about when, uh, when we're um, thinking about our previous service. And it's also a positive manner to help future generations of Canadian soldiers and frankly, of all Western soldiers, because this really is a, uh, an allied effort to avoid the perils that we've heard about of repetitive brain injury. So, um, you know, once I gave them that sort of uh, speech, I guess, that stump speech, then I'd immediately refer to Mike, Ryan or Allison and say, uh, you, you need to convince this guy or a girl that they need to sign on the dotted line. So I think that's how I would get the message across. Thank you. And, and I just wanted to end by saying thank you for joining us and for your support of Project and Less and all you're doing, especially on the Canadian side. All right, my pleasure. And uh, and and I, can I take a moment to thank everybody on this call and everybody listening to the webinar? Yes, sir. This is a frightfully important issue. Uh, one that I, I'm afraid gets buried periodically and then it rears its ugly head when there's an, when there's a, an incident. Um, anything we can do to keep it on the front burner, which is what I'm trying to do up here in Canada, and which I know you're doing successfully down in the United States, is definitely, uh, that's, to use an old army expression, that's the, uh, the juice that's worth the squeeze. So please carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Thompson. And again, if you'd like to join General Thompson and pledge in your brain to Project Enlist, uh, visit projectenlist.org or projectenlist.ca if you're in Canada. Thanks, sir. And finally, I'd like to introduce our last guest, which is uh, Dr. Alex Balbeer. Dr. Balbeer serves as a director for independent services at the Wounded Warrior Project, and who Wounded Warrior Project also provided the foundational funding for Project Enlist. In 2019, he was selected as a President George W. Bush Veteran Leadership Scholar, and Dr. Balbeer currently serves in the United States Navy Reserve as a Medical Service Corps Officer, Healthcare Administrator. And he's a member of uh, CLS Veteran Advisory Board. Dr. Balbeer, welcome. Hey, good afternoon, Scott. Chris, team, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, we talked a lot today about the programs and research that will provide us with better answers in the future to diagnose and treat veterans. But what can we do right now for our veterans and active duty service members? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things we've, and first I wanna say, um, General Thompson, those uh, some very poignant words, uh, and I appreciate your leadership as always. I've had the privilege of working with some of the uh, Canadian medical forces and some training, and it's, they're truly some of the best and well-trained um, military that I've ever had a chance to work with. So thank you for your service. In your commitment to, um, to, to your soldiers, um, sailors, airmen, and Marines as well. So, um, so back to Scott. Yeah, Scott, great question. Um, we talked a lot about research. Uh, Dr. Vaz, Vazdeb gave a great, uh, a, a great talk about some of the more um, you know, neurochemical um, imaging pieces to this. Um, we're tasked here at Wounded Warrior Project to serve the post 9 11 generation. Um, through a variety of programs that touch on physical health and well-being, uh, mental health, brain health, financial health and wellness. Um, it, there's a lot of, a lot of things that can be done. 
uh, which really um, complements some of the work that we that you all are, are pushing for on the research side. Um, specifically, when we look at uh, you know veteran needs right now, it's really access to quality care, uh, timely quality care. And I, and I do believe as an organization with the Warrior Project, we have that opportunity to deliver some of these um, you know, state-of-the-art programs. Uh, one of the hallmark programs that we have here is our partnership with, uh, uh, with four medical centers, academic medical centers that you all are familiar with or have worked with or have trained at. Uh, that includes Massachusetts General Hospital and their home base program, Rush University and their road home program, it's out of Chicago, um, Operation MEND and uh, the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles and the Emory uh, University Veterans Health Program, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we've had the good fortune um, to fund those programs to really start to build um, intensive clinical programming um, for both post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Uh, one thing that we're all very well uh, familiar with is um, these uh, issues related to post-traumatic post stress and traumatic brain injury. They're issues of avoidance. How do we get people into care? There's also the stigma surrounding care. So our goal with, with these programs, especially with our uh, academic medical centers, is to get people into care as quickly as possible and get them um, care that they would uh, that they get over the course of a two to three week period. So think about taking all of those outpatient visits that you have through the course of the year. And some veterans may not um, be compliant with that program. Some veterans may be compliant, but when we can get them to our hospitals in this residential program for a two to three week period, we see some remarkable, remarkable results and de decreases in uh, post-traumatic stress uh, symptomology. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us and something that we've really been committed to over the last five years in getting people uh, this intensive clinical programming. And we've, we've also had the good fortune to expand at all four of our medical centers to start to treat um, traumatic brain injury and symptoms consistent with a traumatic brain injury. So we're looking at both um, uh, treatment paradigms for post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. And it's really been such an amazing investment that we've had. Um, and that investment is made um, by generous uh, donations um, and, and individual con contributors and donors at Wounded Warrior Project who've been uh, really helping us develop these programs and providing the fuel that we need um, to, uh, to build these programs. So that, that, that's some of our more um, uh, you know, detailed programming that we have for both post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. Yeah, and that's, uh, they're great. And that's one of the resources we use with our helpline, affiliation with our helpline to, to refer veterans to. Uh, so excellent, um, uh, that's excellent work being done there. Uh, how do these programs complement other work being done in the space, you know, either at CLF or other veteran service organizations? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, what we provide at, at Wounded Warrior Project is part of uh, a larger effort in the community, both uh, with other veteran service organizations and Project Enlist, um, but also we do partner with the VA as well. The VA is a huge medical center that has uh, great reach and outreach with, with our veteran community. And many of the veterans we do work with um, seek all of their care through the VA. So we have these partnerships. Uh, to do that. We know that the VA can't do this alone. So it's really important for us um, uh, at Wounded Warrior Project to partner with the other uh, entities out there to include the Avalon Network, um, the Cohen Veterans Network, um, to really um, give those veterans and their family support members an opportunity to seek care wherever they want to. I think that's what we want most. Um, certainly, we can fight for patients and warriors amongst ourselves, but the collective good of what we do and the ability to partner with other veteran service organizations and send out referrals and, and, and stuff like that really does provide for um, a really large network that can be accessed at any time in any location. So the, it, it really benefits us all to partner and work together, um, specifically to also partner and to include research as part of that as well. Um, I do not know of a veteran who would not participate in research that might save the life of 
uh, of a fellow service member in the future. So being able to leverage that, leverage that message of both uh, clinical care and participation in research, I think it's very, very important. And I do believe the work that, that uh, we do together with Project Enlist really contributes to that more comprehensive and holistic approach um, to warfighter care and veteran care. Yeah, thank you, very well said. Um, and absolutely agree. And we're, we're now seeing kind of along those lines, more investment in the study of the relationship between TBI and PTSD and CTE. And based on your observations and in a clinical setting, are you starting to see changes in how often veterans are being asked about their history of concussion or blast injury when they're present with other symptoms, when they present with other symptoms that uh, may be related? I, I think we are starting to see that, um, and, and I can attribute that to, uh, to to one, well, to a couple things. Um, one of those things being um, the abundance of literature that's coming out, looking at co-occurring and comorbid conditions. I think it's very important, and some of that more technical medical jargon is starting to really leach out into the communities and and other providers, um, especially maybe on the the mental health and psychological health provider might know a little bit more about um, symptoms consistent with uh, post-concussive syndrome. Um, but that's one part of it. What also has become readily apparent is that um, veterans talk to veterans. <laughs> you and I both know that. Um, and their best advocate is each other. And so when a veteran um, does have access to some great care, let's say at, um, at home base, um, that's our partner at, at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, when they get care there and they're treated in the, and it's a comprehensive approach, what does that veteran do when they get discharged? The first thing they do is they go talk to their friends about it. This is the program I went to. This is the type of, uh, this is the type of diagnostics they did. And I had no idea that perhaps I had low testosterone. And it's that type of dialogue that's not generated by a provider or a, a, another type of clinician. That's the type of dialogue and the peer-to-peer -peer relationship that's built where now there's trust there. That's trust between two individuals sharing a common bond. Those two individuals share information on where they received care, what type of care, what type of diagnostics. And then maybe that person will now start to seek that care for themselves. It just takes one. And then you start to see this snowball and, and this interactive um, you know, effect where now you have a whole group of people now seeking care. I think that's very important. Um, so, uh, so not only the providers becoming better educated in comprehensive veteran care, but we also have a much better, much more educated healthcare consumer out there who is a veteran who now can talk to other veterans and they don't need to talk to um, the clinicians to, uh, to get that type of um, you know, feedback and prompting to go seek care. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I do the same thing myself. I talk to veterans all the time, you know, whether it's at my son's hockey practices or wherever we're at, you know, I'm running into people and we're talking about things like this. So that, that's uh, completely relatable. And have you noticed a difference between how males and females have been asked about their history of concussion and blast exposure when they come in for other concerns? Because we know we, we've seen where we don't quite have the numbers of females that are part of uh, this, you know, the project and list um, pledges and things like that. So we're kind of seeing a, a, a gap between the two. Yeah, I, I think you touched on a, a very, very important topic, um, and especially in, in the U.S. Armed Services now with um, uh, more women serving in increasing um, uh, warfighter capacity um, in all combat specialty now, uh, combat specialties that are now open to women. Um, I think we need to put um, a greater emphasis on understanding how female warriors present um, TBI is, it's, it's even a greater concern for, for female service members now. Um, there's a lot of research out there that's starting to show that um, female warriors can present differently after a mild traumatic brain injury compared to their male counterparts. Um, I think that's very important for clinicians to understand that, but it's also very important for uh, commanding officers, executive officers to understand that 
that males and females present a little bit differently when exposed to something like, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to a traumatic brain injury. Um, we also know that um, that female warriors are more likely be to, to like more likely to be diagnosed with post-concussive syndrome, and to experience fatigue. You know, the, those general symptoms of fatigue, nausea, depression. Um, so it's really important to understand that, and really important to know. Um, and offer that, that support um, to those female warriors and really be able to understand um, you know, th their symptom presentation um, that may in some instances be similar to their male counterparts or may actually be uh, completely different. Um, another sort of a trend that we're starting to see is that um, female warriors, they tend to be less likely to use um, you know, VA related TBI resources uh, than their male counterparts. So there's something about the manner in which um, not only they present clinically, but how female warriors tend to access um, the care that they need. I think it's something that needs to be fleshed out. Um, I, I do believe that the days uh, have passed where we think of a warfighter and the first image that comes to mind um, is a male standing there in their battle, uh, in, their, in their full battle rattle. Um, females are playing a prominent role now, and it's really time for military medicine, VA medicine to understand um, uh, how, how psychological uh, trauma as well as physiological trauma impact the female warrior, because it's important uh, for them to get the most appropriate care um, that, that they deserve as well. Uh, similar to our male, uh, to the male warrior. Yeah, yeah, now's definitely the time to do that. Um, how do, and, and just in your opinion, how do we continue to move the conversation uh, forward and bring awareness to relationships between TBI and PTSD and CTE to a larger community? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And, and I really think back about a time when I was asked um, during an interview, um, if seeking help um, you know, really is um, contrary to the warrior ethos. And I really think that now we are starting to move past that. The warrior ethos, you know, is, is very strong in, in our military, um, but there's nothing wrong with seeking help. And there's nothing wrong with um, having or nothing wrong with a battle buddy bringing you to get help. We never leave a warrior behind. I think that's very important. It's very critical. Um, seeking care does not violate the warrior ethos at all. So bringing that together, whether it's post-traumatic stress or psychological trauma or a physiological trauma through a traumatic brain injury, getting that person the care that they need. Um, but it's also important, Scott, for us to really understand that um, there might be some significant consequences if you do not get the help right now. Um, both uh, suicide is a huge thing uh, right now, a huge issue that we deal with, um, undiagnosed um, issues of depression, uh, post-traumatic stress, very important. Um, and getting that type of help right now can really mitigate some of the more downstream, um, really uh, negative effects. But also knowing that, um, you know, if you've sustained multiple head injuries, that um, what are the consequences? CTE is one of those. Um, and we have to do our best at basically educating our veterans that they need to take care of themselves, regardless whether you think you're dealing with only a traumatic, you know, a traumatic brain injury or only with a, a mental health condition. I do believe that our veterans need to be better educated on preventing some of these more severe downstream neurodegenerative conditions, which we're all familiar with, they are devastating. Um, and especially what we're seeing with CTE. Um, not all veterans are going to develop CTE. That's important for them to know. Um, single head injury, even in many cases, repeated head injury may not result in CTE. But please be aware of the fact that um, there are consequences, if not treated um, appropriately now, um, the, the downstream consequences can be very, uh, very significant. And treatment does work. Uh, we, we do know that treatment works and seeking care does work. Um, but we want to make sure that our veterans are armed and their family members as well are armed with 
the information that they need to make the best decision for themselves right now. Yeah, that's super important. The, 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 the culture, we need to kind of change the culture around how we approach this in the military, in military circles. And I think that's, that's very true. Um, and something that I think we need to focus on. And, and, and I'm sure that our partnership and, and working with other VSOs, we can get that done. Um, I think lastly, we heard Dennis talk about the importance of bringing veterans together. And can you speak more to this and what we can do to continue to foster that collaboration and and build community? Certainly. Um, I, I can tell you um, for a fact that um, our most successful programs at Wounded Warrior Project all coincidentally involve getting veterans together. It's this cohort model, whether it's bringing them to um, uh, an athletic event, a football game, bringing them together, important. Um, also with our Warrior Care Network, when we bring those veterans together to our intensive clinical program, they're going in as a cohort. And so much healing occurs in, in that manner. Um, and, and it's such a, uh, a positive environment that is really run by the warriors in that cohort. Certainly they're getting the treatment from their providers, but we would not see the same effect if we just sent an individual to get that care by themselves. Um, the, the, the opportunity to bring veterans together, that peer-to-peer -peer bond, uh, that education, that healing that they get between each other is, is critical. Uh, it's critically important. Um, and when one service member um, donates or pledges to donate their brain, you see that cascade effect as well. What am I doing now to help my future brothers and sisters uh, in arms? Um, and so really it's that, um, it, it's that union, it's that bond that they all have, uh, the bond that was all established when, when we all raised our hands. Um, and that bond still continues um, even after their service. Um, so all of our programs are geared towards bringing people together um, and really start that healing process because we know how valuable that is to, to the overall health and wellness for our warriors. Absolutely. Very well said. I, and I completely agree. And I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Balbier, for joining us and for all the work that's being done by Wounded Warrior Project to serve veterans. And uh, if you know anybody watching, if you'd like more information on Wounded Warrior Project's resources, we provide a link to the website uh, in, in the chat right now. So thank you, Alex. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the work you've been doing and uh, can, can't wait to continue working with you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate the time. And thank you for all you do as well for our veterans. All right. That was awesome. Thank you, Scott. Uh, great job for his first webinar. Very well done. And Dr. Balbier, that was terrific. I'm um, just checking out all the chats and the cues. This is good. This is a great conversation today. Can't thank you guys enough. I want to thank all of our guests, Dr. Vazdev, Dr. Balbir, Major General Thompson. If you or someone you love is currently struggling with symptoms of suspected CTE, we are here for you. Please reach out to uh, the CLF helpline today at the URL you see there on the screen and in the chat. The CLF helpline provides personalized help to those struggling with concussions, PCS, or suspected CT symptoms by providing treatment, recommendations, and peer support. It's important to know that you are not alone and that help is available. We appreciate you all tuning in and hope you're leaving feeling like you've learned something new. Remember, this month, CLF, along with their partners, CLF Canada and CLF UK, are celebrating International CT Awareness Month. This is a great chance to get more involved. One way to do that is to sign up to participate in clinical research. We'll continue to announce studies all month long, including one that just got approved by the IRB today that I'm sure a lot of you are eligible for. Sign up for the Clinical Research Registry at pledgemybrain.org in the link is in the chat. If you have more questions about managing and treating CT that we weren't able to get to today, be sure to join us next week for a Q&A webinar with CLF Medical Director, Dr. Robert Cantu. You can find a link to register for that session right now in the chat. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining us. We are here to try to help you. Let us know how we can. We look forward to hearing from you and take care.